Hello and welcome to Encryption for Developers, or everything that you want to know about crypto but were afraid to ask. My name is James McKee. I do developer security at Trimble. Um, I have some certs in the development space. I have some certs in the security space, which puts me as a pretty interesting uh, place. Uh, if you want to find me on the internet, you can do so at Punk Coder, uh, and you can also reach me at punkcoder at protonmail.com. Um, I'm also one of the people behind B-Sides Boulder, so you should probably check that out, too, if you like this. Uh, what I do, um, so for years I was a developer, and it was kind of over the time of doing my development work that I ended transitioning into uh, cybersecurity. And now I act as a, an intermediary, really, between the cybersecurity staff and development staff. And that puts me clearly in the Orange Team space. Um, I do things like code reviews, and I teach developers how to do the things that our adversaries will do to our software so that they can learn not to do those things. Uh, it's a fantastic job. I love what I do. Um, but much of this talk kind of comes through that lens. Um, and hopefully that information should be helpful to you, uh, regardless of whether you're following this from kind of a corporate standpoint or an individual developer and talking about encryption. Um, if by some chance I say crypto, I actually mean cryptography, not cryptocurrency. I have a tendency to, to say that. Um, so let's start with story time. Uh, once upon a time, I was working in this role, and I was invited to a code review. Um, and the developer was giving me the opportunity to take a look at some source code. And they wanted me to kind of review the, the piece that they'd done. But this was done by a junior developer, and basically it was writing another login page, and nobody wants to write another login page, so they give it to the to the new guy, and so he goes through and builds this. And he was given the uh, the guidance that developers should salt and hash their passwords. Okay, So what we ended up with was this code, in which they actually took some pretty solid, randomly generated cryptographic salt, hard-coded it into the code, and then took that, appended the that to the password, ran it through a single round of SHA-1, and then saved that off to the database. Now, luckily, we caught this before it ever went to a production environment, um, but it kind of speaks to a disconnect here, right? The developer in this space did exactly what they were told. They just didn't understand the why. But let's stop and step back for a second and ask, how did we get here? Um, you know, developers should care about cryptography. This is one of those things that, you know, if we go into the realm of things that can make applications safe and make them secure, cryptography is one of those pieces. And many of the failures in cybersecurity uh, really come from ignorance about cryptography and the correct ways to use it and the correct applications. Improperly using cryptography can leave you in a spot that's as bad or maybe worse than no crypto at all. Um, the information that gets to developers about cryptography and generally about cybersecurity issues can sometimes be translated through four or five different people before it actually gets to them. Um, and so you have instances where people are living off of kind of tribal knowledge. Um, if they don't know how to handle a certain piece, almost certainly one of the first stops is to go and copy and paste something from Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow, as it turns out, is pretty bad at giving security advice, especially around cryptography. Um, but even if they do manage to find that right place, say they don't end up on Stack Overflow, they end up on Crypto.StackExchange, um, the internet is filled with information that can quickly devolve into really complicated math and very complicated subjects that are not directly applicable and frankly, may just be overwhelming to people that they're trying to get information across to. Add to this, development teams have it rough. Many developers are not classically trained in computers. What I mean by that is these are people who went and if they had any uh, post-secondary education, they're studying, you know, uh, English or teaching or nursing or some of these, and they end up in the software development field through boot camps and things like that. Um, Management kind of expects developers to know all this stuff right out of the gate without training, because um, if we take time to go train our developers, then there's features that aren't getting shipped. Um, ultimately, in some of the worst cases, 
we have groups that are constant questioned, uh, constantly questioned about every step that they make. This seems to happen a lot more in organizations where there isn't a technical mind at the heart of the development process. Kind of the, the project manager doesn't have a technical background. And what ends up happening is you end up forcing people into this uh, mentality where they, if they have to justify everything all the time, um, that doesn't leave any room for saying, you know what, I don't know that. And so it leads to this mentality of being confidently incorrect. Um, and the second part of this is, is because we don't all kind of come from the same background, because we don't all come from the same training space, the language that we speak isn't a common language. And that's kind of one of the themes that comes through this talk, is the fact that in a lot of these cases, as we're going through and talking about it, the language that we use isn't necessarily the same one that's used by the development teams, that's used by the people in security. Okay, so what is cryptography? Let's start from the very basics. Uh, and my the best definition that I like is the art of using mathematics to keep secrets secret. Um, and really that, that kind of plays at the space we are without going too deeply into it, right? But every once in a while you get a development team that says, we're fine, our secrets are encrypted. We have to understand the why here. And this goes back to speaking about the, the kind of subtext here, right? Um, if the group that you're talking to doesn't understand what encrypted means, to them it may mean that it's just unreadable, then you'd have to go into the de uh, deeper parts to help them understand that. And as part of that, we're gonna understand the why behind it. And we're gonna understand when we use encoding, when we use hashing, and when we use encryption, okay? So encoding is this space where we're really going through and talking about representing one set of data as another set of data. And so, you know, in most cases, we'll use things like base64 encoding, where if we pass special characters, it may cause something to blow up as part of the process. It only can handle certain characters. And so because of that, we have to move it to a format where it can be passed through safely and then de pull decoded on the other side, right? So that's when we use encoding. The key piece that we want to know here is there's no secret here. We're just transferring data from one type to another. Okay? Hashing functions. Now, hashing functions are a really interesting space whenever we talk about cryptography. The key here is that we're taking an arbitrary amount of data and we're producing a fixed amount of data based off of that. And ideally, it should be done in such a way that we ensure that there's always a consistent value that comes out the other side and that we can't determine what uh, what data started with the process in order for us to go back to that. So if we take a look at the hashing examples here, we've got the lorem ipsum text and whenever we run that through, we get a hash down here and we can see that down here at the bottom of the first column, we've got a set value. Now, if we were to just slightly tweak that and change that uppercase L to a lowercase L, we get a completely different hash that comes out the other side of that hashing function. And that's one of the real values that we have in this, is that it quickly lets us tell if we have information that's the same on one side as it is on the other, ensuring that we have that integrity across our data. But there's an additional piece to this. Whenever we talk about hashes, if we just have the hash, Generally speaking, we don't know what created that hash. There's no way for us to reverse it. And so because of that, we refer to this as a one-way function. We can only get data out of it one way. Now, if we don't take proper precautions, you may be able to go and take that hash, copy it over to Google, and figure out what produced it. Okay? But encryption is a different beast altogether, and that's really the piece that we want to talk about this. Encryption fundamentally is taking some form of clear text, running it through a function with a key that is held secret from the process, and out what is produced on the other side is encrypted in, or is, you know, changed in such a way that it can't be read. So there's no way for us to get that information back. And it's beyond the encoding, because if you don't have that key, if you don't have that fried chicken ressa, um, you're never going to get that message back. It's always going to be junk. Okay? So, Password storage, you know, is one of those topics that we have to, to talk about this because it's the first real place that most people encounter encryption uh, encryption as part of the process. Um, and I love this question. So 
whenever I tell a group that, you know, we go through this process and they say, okay, how are we supposed to encrypt our passwords? Well, the answer is you don't. Uh, we use key derivation functions, and this isn't fully cryptography, but it's one of those pieces that if we don't talk about it up front, you can easily lose everything uh, before we actually get into worrying about cryptography. Okay? The goal of this is to slow down or stop the leak of passwords in the event of an incident. So if somebody gets our password database, we want to make sure that it takes them the maximum amount of time to try and guess all those passwords so they can come back and use them in other places, maybe people's banks or various pieces like that. So to do this, we use safe key derivation functions. Um, for these pieces, you'll notice that I have some benchmarks to get, kind of give you an idea of what it looks like as we're going through and uh, generating the initial hashes. Uh, so that you understand the values. This isn't done on some like super powerful machine. This is done on a mid-core uh, consumer grade i7 with a, a NVIDIA GeForce uh, 1060. Nothing big here, nothing surprising. Maybe a little bit extra RAM, okay? So the first one we're gonna talk about is the password-based key derivation function two. And really what this thing does is it, we take a password and some salt and we give it a complexity number. And this complexity number allows us to go up and down and kind of view uh, how many iterations that we want this to go through to help secure that process. Um, because the goal is if we're only doing this and we know the right password for testing, um, this process should go really quickly. But for each guess that an attacker has to make, it's going to slow their process down. And so that's really the goal of these functions. Um, and so for this one, we've got password-based key derivation function. It's definitely starting to show its age, um, but it still can still be very, very uh, well set and secured, assuming that you know, use enough iterations. As we go across this, we can see even on kind of this mid-range uh, machine, we're still talking, you know, milliseconds uh, of performance to produce these hashes and check them. So the next one we'll take a look at is Bcrypt, and Bcrypt is really based off of Blowfish. Uh, Blowfish is an encryption we'll get to talk about whenever we get into the uh, symmetric key section of this. Um, but really, this has a very similar process to what we saw with password-based key derivation function two, um, in the fact that it takes salt, a password, and we get to supply the cost. And the cost in this case is measured as an exponent of two to the X, where X is the cost. Um, generally speaking, 12 is about uh, 4,096 iterations. Um, that's kind of the good space we want to go. We, if we go under too many iterations, it'll start to explode and gets really kind of um, easy to break. So the next one we're going to talk about is Scrypt. Scrypt is a password derivation function based on CPU and memory load. And where we see the real transition here is instead of kind of forcing a processor to do it over and over again, we're now scaling out to the resources of the device that will be calculating this hash and locking it into that place. Um, so, you know, if this is done on a server with several thousand cores and lots and lots of memory, um, that's not as much of a problem as if it's somebody trying to crack these passwords on a graphics card, for example, uh, where the cost of graphics RAM is significantly higher. Um, and so we have this key derivation function. We pass it salt and our password. Um, generally speaking, the block size is always going to be fairly standard. So generally speaking, we use uh, eight here, produce a decent sized block. Uh, the parallelization factor is usually set up in such a way that it's the number of cores that you want to dedicate towards actually doing the hashing times two. Uh, the out Put key length is another one of those control pieces that we can put into place here, but we again have this parameter for cost, and this is going to allow us to section off a certain portion of RAM. Now, the interesting thing about Scrypt, if you look at this, the actual processing time associated with generating Scrypt is very low. Okay, we have some outliers in here, but for the most part, it's a, it's a very low process. Um, so much so because of the fact that we are locking this to resources. It doesn't have to do something over and over again. It has the ability to rely on the resources to keep it safe. But we now move into kind of the, the top level of this. And really, Argon2ID, if you're designing a new system, this is the direction you should be going in. 
Um, it locks the key derivation process to memory, execution time, and parallelization. Okay, so we specify all of those pieces in there. We've got our parallelism, number of threads, uh, hashing CPUs times two, um, our tag length, which is what we want to come out, the memory cost that's associated with it, the number of iterations, and this can have a significant impact on the amount of time that it takes them to calculate, as we'll see now. To take a look at these from a breaking standpoint, remember the key is to you know slow down the process of trying to break these passwords as quick uh, as much as possible. So if we run SHA-1 with salt, which is what we saw in our developer's example, we're pulling out 3,800 uh, mega hashes per second. And that is a mind boggling just pass. You can very quickly iterate through an entire word list to find collisions in there very quickly. Even if we were to just upgrade that from SHA-1 to SHA-256, um, not what I would recommend at all, but it's one of the first things that developers, especially ones that don't realize what we're talking about, will pick out of that sample. Um, you still reduce it down uh, by a third, or down to a third. Now, if we move this over to something like the scheme that's used with Mac OS, where it's password-based key derivation function at you know 1,023 iterations, we drop from mega hashes to kilohashes. If we switch that over to Blowfish with something as little as 32, we're now in the thousands of hashes. If we move that over to Scrypt with some decent settings, we get down to the hundreds of hashes. And finally, if we pull in and use Argon uh, 2 ID, currently there is no, uh, no code for actually doing a graphics card based acceleration of this. And so you are CPU locked in trying to crack Argon 2 ID passwords. And so because, uh, password hashes, and because of that, we're down to, on my hardware, uh, effectively 100 and maybe 20 hashes per second. Okay? So, now that we have a deep understanding of how to protect the first entry into our application, we can move on. So, how do we enforce integrity? Um, well, you know, all of our stuff already uses MD5. That's secure, right? Why would we want to change anything? We've got years of, of hashes built up so that we know that things are safe, right? Well, why do we do hashing? The, the first goal is to, to make sure that something is unique. To, again, go back to that example of the lorem ipsum, right? We're going to pull something out so that we make sure that the value is the same whenever we transfer it from one place to another. Um, using that check is really to make sure that data was not manipulated during that process. And if somebody can manipulate that data, we've got problems. Um, additionally, we want to ensure that it can only go one way. We can't determine what the original content from the hash was. And so we get into talking about these, and I'm not going to drain this slide, but the key one that you really have to call out here is uh, MD5 is really, at this point, fully broken. There's been some uh, stuff where people could actually manufacture collisions in that. Um, and so that's that's genuinely a bad thing. Uh, SHA-1 has been weak for many, many years. We've seen collisions in it, and so because of that, it's a good idea to abandon it. But any of the other ones that are on this list are solid. You can use them, and they work for what they need them to. Okay? So, now that we understand how we enforce integrity through hashing, let's move over to symmetric encryption. Now, the interesting thing about, uh, about symmetric encryption is we have a pre-shared key. And that is the consistent piece across all symmetric encryption is that there is a pre-shared key. And so that goes back to our, our piece where we're saying, hey, you know, we have secrets, right? If I have, you know, I'm sharing information between servers and I have to have that password on every server, then any of those servers that get attacked and have that key stolen are now able to leak all the other information on all the other servers. This can be bad. So whenever we talk about using symmetric encryption, you want to make sure that you're only using it in a situation where you don't have to share that key, okay? Or that you're sharing it in a way that we can handle responsibly. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. But the key to this is whenever we do that encryption process, we have text, key produces ciphertext. Decryption produces, takes ciphertext, key, and produces the original text back, okay? Now, all of this kind of relies on the ability to use something known as an initialization vector. And we use an initialization vector to ensure that any time that we push data through the encryption, we always get 
out data that looks slightly different. Because, for example, if we were to go through the process and encrypt the same information over and over again, and say, you know, okay, 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 and somebody were to come and see all of those messages, they would be able to at least determine that those are all the same. And so we're giving away some piece of knowledge as part of that. Um, and the goal of encryption is to not give away any knowledge, it's to keep secrets. So to do this, we have pieces that are built in so that it gives us some variation in how the information is generated from the beginning. To generate that random information, we use an initialization vector. Now, for debugging purposes, most of the uh, frameworks have an initialization vector that includes initialization none, which means that initialization vector includes all zeros. Under no circumstances should you ever use that in a production instance. In fact, I would suggest that you don't even use it in a development instance. Um, the goal here is to really make sure that we go through this process and make sure that we get out random data every single time. Okay. So that brings us to the next piece, which is our symmetric modes. And effectively, whenever we talk about symmetric encryption, most of the cases that we're talking about are block ciphers, at least most of the modern, uh, modern ones are. And this means that it takes a certain amount of data, it encrypts it, and then moves on to another block of that certain amount of data. So it could be eight bytes, might be 16 bytes, whatever it is. We have to take that data, we encrypt it, and then we move on. But it's this kind of iterative process as we go through it. So the question is, is how do we move from one block to the next and make sure that we're keeping things secure? And there are a couple of different ways that we can do this, depending on the goal that you're trying to achieve. So the first way that we do is we just do the same block over and over again. Okay? We don't really have any variations. This is called electro uh, Electronic Codebook Mode, or ECB. The takeaway from this is that each block is the exact same. It's encrypted the exact same way. Okay, And we should avoid this at all costs for all but the ex extremely small messages, and here's why. Whenever you use electronic codebook mode, it's doing those blocks, and you can actually see in the section that we have here that it's going through and it's talking about, we have three blocks set off with two passwords using the same key. We have one small change of an S towards the middle of the password, and we can see that only the center section changes. Now, if you know this, the attacker could use this to change out certain portions of it if they knew that a certain portion of the message was valid or invalid, and they could use this for an attack. So generally speaking, we should never use electronic codebook mode. Okay? So the next one that comes up is cipher block chaining, or CBC. And what we're doing is we're taking the output of one process and using that as the input for the plain text on the other side, on the next process. Now, what this means is that whenever we go through, we can encrypt using a single thread, but whenever we go to decrypt, we can do it in parallel. So it allows us to go through and find those pieces and carry them over as part of the next process. It allows us for, uh, for us, whenever we have a full series of blocks encrypted, to do random seeking in that space. So the next one is cipher feedback. And cipher feedback is another one that goes through and it takes the information out and it supplies it going into the blocks. Now, encryption can't be paralyzed in this case, but decryption can be. Um, and this, again, allows for random seeking through the data that's been encrypted. The next one is output feedback mode. And effectively, this sets it up in such a way that the output from one is included as part of the entry point for the next one. Now, what this means is that we have a stream that goes across, and this effectively creates that streaming process. Data has to come in one side, go out the other side. We can't paralyze the encryption or decryption, um, and it doesn't allow for random reading. But the key feature of this is that if somebody starts listening in the middle of the conversation, even if they have the initial key, they probably aren't going to be able to start listening back in on that conversation. Okay. The last one is counter mode. And counter mode uses a nonce as a counter to increment the initialization vector. Now, the value to this, of course, is that the encryption can be done in parallel, the decryption can be done in parallel, and it allows for random reading as part of the process. Um, 
you know, as we talk about legacy products and the the kind of pieces that are in there, there's some very dangerous pieces of our algorithms that are out there that have been around for years and are used in products um, that we need to pull out. And so, I'm not, again, I'm not going to drain this slide for you, but here's kind of an idea of what we're looking at and when it should have been removed from your product. If you see any of these in your product, just go through and replace them with some of these. Okay, um, And there's some good advice out there for which of the algorithms to use and how to use them. Um, but generally speaking, AES is going to get you most of the cases. If it doesn't, um, there are some other options available to you. So this brings us to asymmetric encryption. Asymmetric encryption is really our traditional Alice and Bob story. Um, we've got two people who want to share information between each other, and they want to do it in such a way that they don't risk losing information as part of the process. And to do this, we have two pieces. We have this idea of a public key and a private key. And the public key can be shared with anybody. This is completely open public knowledge. Anybody can have it. And the idea is, is that if I want to send, to send a message to somebody who is using that public key, all I have to do is get a copy of that public key, take my message, encrypt it using their public key and their ciphertext on the other side. Now, the interesting part about this is, uh, is that I can't, you know, I can pass this text around. And if they only have the public key, they should not be able to get the information out of the message that went into it. So it should be safe for everybody to have a copy of it, save for Bob. And then when Bob gets it, Bob actually has the tool, he has that private key to take and decrypt the message using the ciphertext and usually a password protecting Bob's private key. So you have two layers of protection. One, they have to have physical access to the key, but two, they also have to have the password to unlock it. So it's something they have and something they know. And that ends up producing this text back again. So why do we use asymmetric data encryption? Uh, really, it serves two really good purposes for us. The first one is it ensures that data can always be decrypted by the right people. And assuming that it has decrypted on access, um, so assuming that they're using a password for this to, to unlock that private key, we can actually go and say, a, at a high level that we feel more secure that this person is the person who should be reading it. Um, because you it, theoretically in this space, if you have a, an encrypted message and they steal the private key, if they don't have that password to unlock it, that should be only in the person's mind and they should be the only person who has it. Um, in that instance, only then should they be able to open it up and decrypt it. Okay? Um, and additionally, we have this kind of element of integrity which means I can say that if I know that I'm keeping my private key safely and I want to prove that I generated something, I should be able to sign a copy of something using my public key in this case, or using a signing key pair, I should say, um, to prove that I was the one who generated this message. I can send it out so that everybody can decrypt it, but since I was the only one who was able to encrypt it, we know that the message came from me and we can use that to validate that the source of the data was exactly what we thought it was. Okay? So signing really works in this function and it uses uh, is used for, you know, for us being able to validate things. And we see this in a lot of cases, um, you know, tools like generating uh, uh, JWTs and things like that will allow us to use encryption to verify that the source of the data was original. Okay, so we take some data, we take a hash, and then we go through and we sign that hash. And now we have the ability to say, if I ship the data, that original portion of uh, corporate ipsum with that hash and that message, I can now say that this data that I sent you is correct by value of the fact that I ran this hash through it, got a value that was cryptographically sound, and then signed that and sent that to you. Now you have verification that not only the data that was sent as part of the package was correct, but also that I was the one who said it was correct. Okay. Um, which brings us to the point where we start actually talking about algorithms. And there are two main algorithms in this space that we can talk about. Um, the first one is RSA. And RSA was originally designed in the 1970s. Um, and 
the math behind it basically relies on the fact that factoring really, really large primes is very difficult and time-consuming to do. Now, the key to this is that it really gives us a space where, as we scale up on this, it gets more and more difficult to try and guess those keys. And so, at low bit rate for the keys, we run into problems. So, for example, 256 keys can be broken in about 35 minutes. 1024 is really kind of that minimum considered to be secure. You really want to be at 2048. But once we get up to 4096, we've got something that's fairly resilient going forward, but runs into the problem that generating keys of that size is a very, very time-consuming process. And the further we go up that, the processing time necessary to generate larger keys gets exponentially larger as we go up through this. Um, and so it's both a, a blessing and a curse in that way that we have something that you know gets more difficult to process that way but becomes more difficult for us to generate um generally speaking when you hear about uh quantum uh, quantum affecting cryptography this is usually what they're talking about because the properties of quantum computers are such that they will allow for the quick factorization of prime numbers which could put rsa uh at risk so, so what do we do to shift away from that? We have what's called elliptic curve cryptography. And really it f addresses a lot of these um, underlying pieces. And really ECC is very fast. It's structured so that it can be run on very low performing hardware. And it's generally considered to be pretty strong against future uh, incidences of and you know, quantum cryptography problems, right? Um, so generally speaking, whenever we're looking at doing public key, private key, now we really want to go in and we want to be doing elliptic curve. Okay? But there are some things that you have to know about elliptic curve, and it can get really kind of challenging to go through this process. Um, there's a website that will give you a list of safe curves to use, and they go through and they list all of these. Um, the final note on this is probably, you know, I I personally can't tell you whether you should be using them or shouldn't be using them, whether they're safe or whether they're not safe. Um, there's a lot of question in that space as to what constitutes safe or unsafe. Um, but if you want to avoid that conversation altogether, uh, just don't use those. Um, there are two really good curves out there. Um, the first is curve 25519. Uh, which is generally considered a really good one, or P256. And both of these, uh, depending on the hardware that you're looking at, may actually have hardware acceleration that really pushes that to the next level. Um, generally speaking, those are going to be the two that you're going to want to use. If you need something that's got a kind of a higher level of security um, and you're willing to burn off a couple extra CPU cycles to make it work, uh, ED448 Goldilocks is a good choice. Okay. But say, you know, we've got you know, symmetric key encryption, which is really good for transferring information quickly um, and encrypting large amounts of data using private key, uh, private public key is really slow. How do we kind of bridge that gap? And generally, when we do that, we talk about hybrid encryption. And what we have is we have two groups that have their public keys and private keys, and we go through a key negotiation process where we generate a random key. And then we encrypt the bulk of the data that we want to, you know, pass back and forth between us with that key. And then we wrap it up in the public key, private key exchange. And so what we'll do is we'll take and we'll transfer the data. And when we're done with that, we'll take and we'll transfer the key to that data using public and private key cryptography. That way we effectively have a balance of data that's transferred to one place to another safely and then is decrypted once the party that we know is going to be receiving it decrypts that random key for the symmetric portion and then can decrypt the main part of the, pay of the payload. Um, and that's really what we talk about whenever we talk about hybrid encryption. Okay, so this kind of brings us to the last piece, right? We've talked some about encryption, we've talked some about hashing, we've talked some about passwords and all of this, but you know, anytime we talk about encryption, you know, the problem comes of the key, right? Somebody inherently has to know the key and somewhere somebody has to be able to hold it. Otherwise, we can't use it, right? 
So where do we put them? Um, generally speaking, your encryption is only as good as your storage key. And what you're doing with that can make it either stronger as far as the protection or really weaken it. And so when we talk about this, some really bad places to store encryption keys are things like in Docker secrets. Um, so first of all, it should be known that Docker, whenever you do a Docker secret, is only base64 encoded. Um, so that's not really encryption at all. Um, but if assuming that you go through and encrypt your data in the secret and then you put that secret in a base64 encoding and then store it in there, it's still not safe. You don't want to stick your encryption keys in Docker or uh, Kubernetes at all. Uh, web configs or other similar config files is generally also a bad idea. Don't put these keys in source code. Um, if you've got questions about how easy it is to disassemble something, um, it's painfully easy to get a hold of your code and disassemble it. Um, don't stick it in environment variables um, because attackers have, if they get access to the environment, they also have access to those variables. Um, Generally speaking, don't stick them in databases. One of my favorite stories is I had a group that came to me and uh, showed me their database structure, and they said, okay, all of our data is safe now. Everything's safe and secure. And I said, well, yeah, it kind of is, except for, you know, you could get into your system via SQL injection, and on each row it has a row encryption key as one of the columns. So they don't store it in the database. They can get access. That's where it's going to be. Um, don't stick keys in open memory. And this is kind of a tough one for a lot of groups to kind of really wrap their minds around. Um, effectively, what happens is even when you're pulling these things into memory, somebody can dump the memory of your application, get those debug pieces, and dump your application and pull that out. And so we want to meet, make sure that whenever we handle that, we don't want to have our encryption key sitting out there because that's effectively giving away the data. Under no circumstances, ever stick secrets into source control. This is a horrible idea. Um, encryption keys, those type of things have no place belonging anywhere in your data whatsoever. Uh, build servers. The number of teams that I've seen sticking you know, encryption keys and secrets in build servers is an awful idea. Don't do that. Um, good places to stick encryption keys. If you're on a device, having the TPM generate a key or generating a sub key from a key that's stored in the TPM is a fantastic way to ensure that that key is held securely. Um, inside operating systems, they're usually credential management systems. You know, it's better than storing them directly on the hard drive, but still not quite the same level. Um, if you're in cloud environments or you're going to on-prem, a key vault can be a fantastic option. And so what that does is it allows you to segregate your encryption keys away from the rest of your applications so that it's only available on request. And then whenever you make that request and whenever you pull it local, use secure strings. Most of those are built into, applica into uh, application frameworks to allow the safe containment of secrets. It's not great, but it adds an extra level of difficulty into extracting them. Yeah. So if you want additional reading in this space, I would strongly recommend picking up a copy of Applied Cryptography. Um, it is a fantastic book, despite its age. Hopefully we will get a third edition at some point. Um, additionally, we have Practical Cryptography Developers. Currently, the entire book is, uh, as much of it as written, is currently available on the web, and definitely thank you for that. Um, with that said, I would like to thank you, and I will be around to take questions. Uh, thank you very much.